it's been wonderful. But anyway, so, so with Joe, mm-hmm. I'm trying to remember when when this first clicked with me. I think it was when I was on a road trip with a friend of mine, and I just listened through the entire book on like as an, an audio recording, all in one go, and it started to finally click with me that. This is how I saw it the first time. Job's the pro- fundamental issue with the judgments that Job's friends are making is that they assume that the story is over. So they say things like, "I think it's in the first it's in the first response to Job by his friends." He says, "God will never leave the righteous ones down. Like he's he'll lift them up. Mm-hmm. He'll raise up those who who are righteous and those who follow him." And then, right, as you get a little, you, you go through the, the, the dialogue cycle a few more times, they start to say, well, God hasn't done that for you, so obviously you sinned, right? Mm-hmm. They, they, they're, they're sort of building up this argument of, well, hey, we can look at your life and we can, we can make this judgment now. And, and the irony to me is, right, because you've got the structure of Job is you've got like a little bit of narrative frame at the beginning and the end. Mm-hmm. Just in terms of sheer words, very little is, at the, is, is actual narrative. The vast majority of it's this conversation. Which is also weird. It's kind of like Tolkien and Beowulf. How everyone thought Beowulf had this really badly written structure for a long time until Tolkien came along and, and wrote The Monsters and the Critics. And he said, no, look, the, the abrupt transition from Beowulf's glory days to him being this decrepit king who goes and gets slain by the dragon mm-hmm. is actually the point of the story. It's like, if you see that, then you understand what it's like to be a person and in a way of a forgetting of who we are as human persons. So that's what I took away from your talk, Jonathan. Does that sound, uh, do you, would you own that? Uh, most of it, I would okay. say. <laughs> what did I miss? No, no, you didn't miss anything. I just have to say, just, I would say, I, I would say that, uh, I would say that the, at least in our situation, I, I don't, like the heavenly Jerusalem is eschatological, right? So in some ways it, it can't be completely known by human forms now, it can be, you can be, it can bring you closer, right? And so you can be brought into an inkling and into a, an, a, a, an anticipation and into a, a, let's say, a smell of, of what is the final uh, revelation. And in some ways it has to do, so, you know, I, I didn't go as deep into the notion of memory, but that's the best way to understand it. It's like, uh, you know, we think we only remember things in the past, but actually, no, we also remember the future. Uh, and that's, an, that's a mm. moment when we're remembering the future. You know, we're, we're actually remembering in the, in the future. And you do it all the time, by the way, it's not weird. It's not like this weird magical thing I'm saying. You know, every time you build something, you're remembering the future because you haven't made your thing yet. And so you're, you're looking into the, in the, into the future and you're remembering towards that point. And the, and the heavenly Jerusalem is the ultimate version of that, right? So, um, plus you've probably learned some things that have made you a different person today than the person you were yesterday. Yes. The person you are tomorrow and next week and next year and 10 years from now is going to be a different person than the person you are today. Not just person, but a different being than you are today. You, you might, you'll be the same person, but you'll yes. be a different person functioning body yes okay I, I, okay yeah, I, and I so yeah, I just, what, what i want to tie into that is um i just had a really fascinating conversation with neil degrade and drew garrett about music okay. and drew brought up this idea that melody um you can't have a melody at one moment in time you can only have a melody if you have time because the notes move through time in order to complete the melody and that when you're singing a melody you have to have a memory of the notes that came before as well as a memory of the notes that are coming a kind of expectation of the notes that are coming and um neil brought up the idea well that's very like a scroll If you have a whole story or narrative written out on a scroll and you have the top part rolled up tight so that it's not showing what's at the top and the bottom part is rolled up like this and all you can see is what's in the middle Mm -hmm. and then you continue to read and it unscrolls. So you have a memory of what came before, but you are right in here at this center point. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's, that's what we are. We're in this now with a memory of what 
was in the past. Our body has a memory of what was in the past and our body yes. has a memory of what is to come, I think, because I think that's what's happening at the cellular level that Michael Levin is always talking about how these cells know what to build and where to build it because they have some kind of a memory of yes. what is to come. The instruments are getting in on the dialogos. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think sometimes that's what like jamming is like. If you ever, have you ever play with people, you get into a pocket. It's, I think, basically the di dialogos. It's like you hit a pocket, like, whoa. Yeah. You're mm -hmm. And then you guys all start moving as one unit. And it's like, it's very, very interesting, very intense sometimes. Oh, yeah. There's only a few uh, events in life that I've had where that are comparable, I think, because like <clears throat> some of my favorite moments playing have been those where ever the whole band just locks in. And it's like yeah, Whoa. and then you start doing things that you would never consciously choose to do. It you're not used to you stop making decisions. It's the spirit of the group that's making the the decisions. Yeah, yeah. It's it's such a beautiful thing. I mean, I think maybe when we ask the question, what are people meant to do? That seems to be something that is, uh, seems to be a pretty good answer. You know, like what- Chris what is people... asking possession. Is it possession? Oh, it might be. <laughs> well, I think there's something about like, um, like what the dancer or the musician does is very different than what the painter or maybe like the sculptor does, right? The the, the product that the artist makes, that the uh, uh, painter makes becomes separate from, you do the act and then there's a product from the act. Whereas the musician and the dancer are coterminous with the the product, quote unquote, with the art, right? With there is no dancing without the dancer. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, so the, is the filmmaker a sculpture then? Mm. Yeah, I think something where um, there's a physical object left over from the act of creation. Yeah is a different different kind of art where the uh, the action itself is the art form. Yeah. Well, cuz like I've had I've had similar experiences as um like a short story writer mm -hmm. where you're in the flow and that feels very much like being in a pocket mm -hmm. with another band or with other band members but you're in the flow with whatever the, I don't know. It's weird. Yeah, because like being in a pocket is maybe, maybe, maybe being in a pocket is the same thing as when you're writing, maybe or even like writing. Let's just say a, a letter to a friend, a handwritten letter. You can get into a pocket that way too, right? So I'm trying to give yeah. instances that are relatable for people to understand what it's like being in a pocket. So. What's weird, though, is when you're in a pocket with the band, it's like everybody writing a short story at the same time and and getting that, that phenomenological feeling of uh, elation. Mm -hmm. And then everybody's locked in on that together. So it, I've had the same thing, even with carving some of the wood carvings where you can just get in a mode. Maybe it's just a flow state, I guess. A flow state, yeah. But I think like um, something like a writer's room, right, where they're writing a, a TV show or a movie, they probably experience something like getting into the pocket. Yeah. Yeah. Or or like because art isn't like a, I don't think art is a one way road. Um, art needs a participant, not only the creator, but so the observer or the witness, I suppose. So like, okay, so when I when I was a kid, I remember watching, uh, I was talking about this with a friend of mine yesterday. I was watching Encino Man. Okay. And, and 
I couldn't tell as a kid whether or not, and I'm like 10 or 11 at this time, maybe 12. A part of me was still trying to convince me that Brendan Fraser was really, not really a caveman, but maybe he really couldn't, didn't know how to speak. I had the same experience when I was watching um, uh, Fifth Element and the gal that's playing in Fifth Element. I would had the same, so I was, I had this tendency to be able to be captured by the stories or the performances. Mm -hmm. And um, I think there's something similar to that. If I'm in a really, if I'm uh, watching a movie or a film and I'm immersed in the story, that's a flow state too. Yeah. If it's done well, you know, and yeah, if it's a really good movie. Right. And so you can tell when it's not doing it. Well, like I, I went, my wife and I went to watch, um, the I, that's even how we describe it, right? Like if we're watching a movie and we turn it off, we say, I just wasn't into it. Your intellect to take the Thomistic understanding, which is that all knowledge originates in the senses. Now this is a really important thing, right? Because we are not like the angels. We are not merely spirits. We're not merely immaterial. We are hylomorphic creatures who are spiritual and animal or both. And so because of that, what we do is we go through this process of acquiring knowledge through our senses. And then once it's in our immaterial intellect, then we can do all kinds of stuff with it. You can go anywhere you've been, you know, you can go anywhere that you remember. You can imagine places, you can read things, you can do mathematics, you can work out. Look, I mean, it's even as you can work out. Th think about the development of the intellect with mathematics. When a child is little, they can't do math in their head yet. They have to count it out on the, it's, it's a fit there. They have to see the they have to see the knowledge in front of them, and so there's this. It's less self-completing. They have to bring matter into the process. But then when you're once you know the math, oh, you can just do it up here. And the real math geniuses, they can do things that are totally beyond us, and they can they can sit there and just run through these complex uh, computations in their head, and then bam, there they are. And I I don't have the capacity to do that. The way I get around it is to go back into the material and use aids. So the angels, this is really interesting. The angels, they're, the way that they approach in their, their form of intelligence is actually the opposite of ours. So we move from individuals to principles. You look at a dog, you see another dog, you see this dog, you see that dog, you see that dog, and then you can have an idea of a dog. And then once you've done that, you recognize dogs all over the place. And then once you've seen enough different, say, dogs and cats and pigs and also lizards, because we compare things, this is how our intel intelligence works. It works by comparing. A dog is not like a cat, but a cat and a dog are like each other in a way that they aren't like a lizard. Now you can form this principle of mammals, of mammalian life. And then you can vertebrate life. And so you can see how taxonomy, the way we've structured our ta taxonomy is like that. You can get to this high level of animal. There's some see right. An animal is way more abstract than a dog, which is more which and it's also more abstract than a mammal, which is more abstract than a dog. And it's it's these levels of abstraction. So Toma talks about the the spiritual intelligences, the angels, as being the reverse of that. And a, the more intelligent an angel is, the let's say the more fundamental its knowledge is. So you might have an angel that, and this is, is, is may sound really weird at first, but just go with it. You might have an angel to go back that, that understands dog. And through dog, it knows every possible individual dog, right? So we go from the individual dog to this principle of dog. And the angel starts with the principle of dogness and can see every possible permutation of the principle of dogness. Now, now you have two angels, one that under, that's been given the principle of dogness and one that's been given the principle of mammal. And the one that understands the principle of mammal has a greater intelligence than the one that understands the principle of dog because there's more contained within the, the idea of mammal than there is within dog. Dog is a subset of that. And so you can go on and on and on and up. And you can see how in this weird sense, the more simple the idea is, the more simple the principle is that the angel has been given, the vaster its intelligence. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Oh, I want to talk about this one last time. So one more time. This, this, this is also important to understand 
that art that is civic and that is celebration, that is participating in identity, necessarily has to have certain forms, right? If you take an art that is there to question, to poke, right, to rip at the identity of something, and you put it up in a public space, and you put it up as a civic monument, you are entering very dangerous, a, di a very dangerous place. And the difficulty we have, and, and I'm saying this because there's a lot of that that happened in churches in the past 50 years, and it wasn't done on purpose. It was done with, with people who were looking at the modern art around them and not totally sometimes understanding visually what the art was doing, not completely gathering into themselves the, the implications of showing broken people, of showing you know, things that are cut, things that are, things that are shredded, and then just putting that up in public spaces in, in, in the church, uh, you know, just wanting to kind of be modern and not realizing that, that there, there are, and these are very organic, they're not arbitrary, right? It's like, if I take a picture of your mother and I rip it, like, you know what that means, right? You know, if I, if I show a disfigured version of someone you love, you know what that means. And so the fact that we just kind of forgot that and we've accepted these weird things. And so this is, this is a, 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 a monument in Montreal. It's in Montreal, that's why I care about it so much, uh, by David Atmed. You know, the Museum of Fine Arts bought a church across from itself and uh, used it to show art. And so the, the beautiful old church, uh, you know, and then they commissioned you know, a monument to put in front of the church. And this is the monument. And so... Right, the transformation is, is full, right? The broken, empty angel whose wings are falling off that has an empty chest, uh, that has no face, uh, you know, that is half mechanical, half made, half flesh. You don't know what it is. And these types of statements, they're not, they're not arbitrary. And so, you know, what you're seeing in some ways is the, is the, the evisceration of the church, which was now transformed into something else. I, I wish they would have done it differently. They could have, or they could have done it differently, but that's the way that they decided to go at it, um, possibly for reasons. Um, all right. Right. Right, yeah, exactly. We, we went to watch The Batman, my wife and I, back when it was out, the, the, the latest. The most Batman. recent one? Okay. Yeah. And I was like, I was so into it, dude. I was like, this is really interesting. I, like, I didn't care that it didn't have, it didn't match up with like the Batman archetypes or anything. I don't care about any of that stuff. Like none of that stuff means anything to me, really. Mm. I was, it was still a compelling story. I thought, well, first of all, I was like, oh, this is interesting. It kind of reminds me of the movie Seven, which is one of my more favorite movies growing up as a youngster. So it had this element, it had a noir element, which I really like noir. And I was just, I was like, man, this is really fascinating movie. And I was so locked into it. And then they made the mistake of um, dropping a line in that movie that completely put, knocked me out of the story right in the middle of the movie. I'm like, why did you do that, dude? Like it was, a, you know, like the, 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 the gal, the Catwoman girl says something like, she could have said this any number of ways, right? She could have said that Bruce Wayne is, you know, a greedy bastard or whatever. But instead, she said that he has white privilege. And because that buzzword showed up, it just completely kicked me out of the movie. It's like, why did you take the risk of putting that in there? Just like, what was the point of that? Because you completely had a great story going. You could have said the same exact thing with never having to say the buzzword. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so as a storyteller, I suppose you never you want to be co cognizant of that. You know, like you don't need the buzzwords to tell the right story. Mm. Because everyone gets old and then mm -hmm. the dragon comes. 